So let's first know, number one, that Africa is not third world. Africa is the first world. Africa is not third world. Africa is not first world. America can't be the second world or the first world or even the third world. Because the current America, I hope you know, the people who populate America now, they stole that country from the original people of that land. Now, don't try stealing because you'll be arrested even when you're a general. But for them, they stole a country and got away with it. In 1619, they came to America, stole a whole country from the Native Americans. The Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Arawak, the Namahawk, the Tokomo Sioux, the Tiano, the Grunchi. They stole it. They killed them all. Killed all of them. They found 37 million. They killed them. They would even carry the heads of their leaders into the church and pray to thank God who has helped them. Because in the military, you should know that in times of battle, God is always on the side of the strongest battalions. It makes strategic sense for God. Why would you join the weak side if you are God? <laughs> you have to look. <laughs> no, that is the battalion that I need to be on the side. <laughs> so if you are weak and you are praying to God, you have to know what side God will be on, not yours. In the side of battle, God is always on the side of the strongest battalion. But that's not why we are saying that Africa is the first one. No, we are saying Africa is the first one because Africa is the origin of humanity. Humanity started in Africa, right from the period of uh, Earth creation, or the, when Earth emerges about 3.5 billion years, you know, when you have life in the embryonic age. Africa sees the age of fish about 250 million years. It sees the age of prosimian about 70 million years. And then 50 million years is the last great tectonic movement, the tectonic movement that split the earth. And most of the continents split away from Africa. North and South America splits, but remain together. They don't split at that time. Now, about uh, after the tectonic movement of 50 million years, then you go to what they call in paleontology, uh, the age of or, or in the age of man is from 40 million years to about 25 million years when you get the age of eight man and the Austral people at the time humanity is already in Africa and already around the Nile Valley in East Africa stretching maybe up to Zimbabwe 5.5 million years 3.5 million years you got what they call him to have uh, to have a concept of socialization. And then by 1.5 million years, you have what they call Homo erectus. Homo erectus walks upright. Homo erectus discovers fire. And with fire, he can scare away animals, he can cook food, he can, he can have so many applications. And that's why in Africa, we always kept fires in our homes to remind ourselves uh, of uh, the ingenuity that African people put together to have fire. Homo erectus, the oldest Australian the oldest Australopithecus was discovered in Ethiopia. You know, in, uh, it's called Australopithecus ramidas. And Lucy. So the Ethiopian naturally protect, protested at the name because the name identifies you with your land, your language, and culture. Although, if you are brainwashed or colonized, uh, in your inferiority, you want to identify yourself with your master. So you choose a name that doesn't identify you with your name, language, and culture. If you meet an Indian and you ask him what's your name, the Indian is not going to say my name is Wartomise or my name is Odong or Uko. No, he says I'm Rajiv, I am Singh, I am Khan. If you meet a Scottish man, long nose, you know, looking for gold, and he says what's your name, he's going to say I'm MacRitchie, McDonald's. He's not going to say my name is Tumerasi or my name is Aboki. <laughs> now, how far do you think if you ask a black person, tall, dark, and handsome, blessed of the sun, and say, what's your name? And say, my name is Joseph. My name is Josephine. My name is John. It speaks of your ultimate form of colonization and submission. For example, the name John means what? Means toilet. <laughs> Go to the Oxford Dictionary. Can you read the Oxford Dictionary? The name John means toilet. It also means the client of a prostitute. Now, some of you might have conducted 
prostitutes. But do you really need to call yourself and say, I am a client of a prostitute, therefore my name is John? Huh? Let me give you another common name, the name Peter. Go to Oxford Dictionary. Get us the name Peter. Can you get us the name Peter? Uh, Peter? This is the name Peter. Here. Uh, Peter. Yeah. Uh, diminish or come to an end gradually. So, if you say, right, I'm the man who has diminished and come to an end gradually. Uh, why? Because why? Why should you name yourself after your slave master? And you have the audacity even to say it's a Christian name. It's not a Christian name. It's a European name. Jesus never saw Europe. None of the apostles came from Europe. All of them came from Africa and Asia. And surprise, surprise, there are actually no white people in the Bible until toward the end. The Bible starts where? In Africa. And ends there. So, uh, I was just having a go at your name, thinking that I will you know, make you feel so uncomfortable. And maybe when you go home, you can remember, do you have a father you can name yourself after? Maybe you say, come higher over Chimika Kingakuma. When you say Wachimika, immediately you speak about my father. And the person in Africa dies when you are forgotten. Why are you naming yourself after these people? What have they done that is so good that you should name yourself after them? You know, if some names are really ridiculous, like Pankarasino. <laughs> Josephine. I can't understand the Jones, you know. But what about the Finn? Are you fish or what? Yeah? No, no, you are making me so ashamed of being a black person sometimes. <laughs> Yet I don't want. But Africa is the origin of humanity. The oldest uh, Homo erectus is in actually the Museum of Kenya. It was discovered in a place called Nariakatome, which is near Lake Tukan, carbon dated by Oxford, uh, 1.5 million years. After this Homo erectus leaves Africa and goes to populate uh, Asia, and through uh, Kenya, you know, where we have like Niger, Kenya, and Tanzania, populate most of these islands, going up to India, up to China, and then the next stage in humanity's progression is what they call Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens is more than man who could sit in here and command a battalion or a platoon. <laughs> Homo, Homo sapiens, the oldest Homo sapiens is was uh, the, the fossils or the bones of Homo sapiens were discovered. Uh, by Liki and Kamoya Kimei in, in uh, Omo Valley at the border of Ethiopia and Kenya. Now, it was this Homo sapien that leaves Africa about 60,000 years to unpopulate the rest of the world. He is in Europe 40,000 years, known as Gromondi. Gromondi, the first people to populate uh, Europe were black people. As you can see, uh, their figurine or their representation, this is called the Hottentot Venus. Uh, typically, you know, morphologically uh, black. A uh, black person, black woman has what they call stitopedia, the unusual accumulation of fat <laughs> on uh, the black woman's behind. I'm sorry if it looks like your sister. <laughs> but I am so proud of the Hottentos Venus. This sister set the standards of beauty in the whole of Europe. If you look at images of Europe in 171700, you see Europeans, because they have an iron in board backside, you know, they would uh, have a mesh, you know, around their waist, and then they have dresses that look like this. Because, you know, the African Gromorbi, who brought the Organization culture into Europe, you know, have set the standards. They were African people in India as Dravidians. There's still a huge black population of about 200 million. In India, uh, Gandhi called them the Harijan, and the caste system in India put them at the bottom of the Indian society. The first people to populate China, they became the Semans. First people to populate Japan, you know, the Ainu or the Masara Negroes. And I did say that they came from Eastern Uganda, Western Kenya, known as Masara Negroes. That's why Japanese names are like African names. Toyota Muro, Nakahara, Kishaka, uh, uh, Kato, Nakamura. Yeah? So these are all African names. In ancient times, the whole world belonged to the black man and the black woman. Now, the definition of races 
appears during the ice age, you know, about 20,000 years. Because you know that as a black person you have melanin. This is a black skin pigmentation. Melanin is a, is a carbon that does not de deteriorate over time. It is also a stable atom. Melanin is produced by an enzyme called melatonin. 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 M-E-L-A-T-I-T-O-N-I-N. Uh, melatonin. Now, for melatonin to produce melanin, it needs a catalyst enzyme you call tyrosinase 7. If you don't have no tyrosinase 7, you can't have black skin. In biology, they say you are depigmented or you are an albino. Actually, the word albinus is a Latin word that means white. So I am here to tell you, those of you who are afraid of America and their bombs, that the white man is an albino in biology. I am not the one who said it. You know? <laughs> uh, but that is mere elements of biology. Lack of melanin, they say you are the, the, the pigmented melanized or albino. Now, melanin is so key and so crucial. You have to look at melanin. If you go on the internet and type on melatonin, you'll find over 5 million entries. They are making thousands of products out of melanin. Melanin is responsible for synergizing the ultraviolet rays of the sun and the energy of the earth. You know, uh, it protects you against the ultraviolet rays of the sun. Melanin controls aging. So as a black person, you age properly. Those of you who have seen Bill Clinton and his wife, Ritro Hillary, uh, you used to see them as young, but now they look like your oldest grandfather because they have no melanin. Melanin controls aging, melanin controls fatigue, melanin controls sleeping cycle, but melanin also gives you dominant genes. Which means if you are, uh, and this is the mere element of, uh, of uh, genetics. Genetics uh, starts with a man called Gregory Mendo. Gregor Mendo is the father of genetics. And Mendo was looking at genes and gene sequences and, and, and inherited characteristics. And he was looking at dominant genes and recessive genes. Because white genes are recessive, which means they keep going down. And black genes are dominant, which means they keep going up. So if you have a child with a white person, at birth that child will have more black genes and less white genes. As the child grows up, the white genes are recessed, they keep going down, and the black genes go up, they assert themselves. When the child is in the tropics, and he's hit by the sun, the body produces more melanin, the nose becomes wider, taking more hot air, the <laughs> hair becomes good, just like his. This is known as phenotype adaptation. So, melanin is key. Melanin is significant. And after careful experiments, Mendo concluded that if you had begun with white people, you'd never have got black people. Because no two white chickens can produce a black chicken. No two white goats can produce a black goat. No two white cows can produce a black cow. You should not have to carry this experience. You don't have to say to your uncle said this and he was lying. You can go and get two white chickens and dance for them and play fruit. They will never, because a recessive gene can never produce a dominant gene. Which means in biology, in genetics, you are the father and the mother of humanity itself. Now, don't take my word for it. Some white people protested and said, no, 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 it can't be. Maybe, yes, maybe the, uh, something happened and white people we couldn't get their own, <laughs> but maybe biology doesn't support this. So 1984, Berkeley, California, you know, Rebecca Kahn and Stringer and Stone King they carried out an experiment looking at what they call mitochondria DNA. You know, when you are having uh, a spiritual congress, why people call it sex in five we don't call it sex, a spiritual congress. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> when eventually all your senses become active and you start writing poetry in bed, huh? <laughs> you pass genes, and normally you have what they call nuclear DNA, and that is exchanged almost in equal number. But you have it. A woman has a gene and right? says, ha, I'm sorry, I'm wet. I don't trust you. And passes a gene secretly to a child. That gene is called mitochondria DNA. Empty DNA. Uh, mita from Greek word, mother. That is only inherited from your mother. So if we have to know who is your mother, we can follow that gene. 
So that is what Rebecca can be with stunting and stringer. And they collected embryos of ethnic women. And they arrived at the first woman whom they said they called African Eve. And she was from where you were standing. Mitochondria are tiny structures found inside nearly all human cells. It is separate from the normal chromosomal DNA that dictates our height or the color of our eyes. Men inherit it from their mother, but they can't pass it on. In women, it carries on from mother to daughter, down the endless generation almost unchanged. And this is how we can trace our way back to our genetic Eve and her daughters. So written within it is the history of the world's women and therefore the human race. Professor Rebecca Kahn was the pioneering scientist who uncovered the first all-important clue. I started working on human mitochondrial DNA so that I would have some kind of view that was objective that would help me understand and help other people understand how humans around the world were related. With this new science, she could. Harmless mutation happens all the time in some part of the mitochondrial DNA, leaving minute markers at every change. These markers are like barcodes and can be read in the same way. Khan and her team discovered the changes happen at a fairly constant rate. They found the groups with the earliest markers were the Africans living inside Africa and wondered if they might be the oldest people in the world. I was very excited when I first started to get evidence and it was so counterintuitive. I'd put 20 Europeans and 20 African Americans on a sheet of x-ray film and every African American showed differences and all the Europeans looked the same. And I thought I'd mislabeled something or I thought I'd made some drastic mistake. And we kept repeating and repeating things. And as we got more samples from different areas, I realized that it was a, a difference in the pattern and that this whole new type of evidence based on mitochondria was going to change the way we thought about modern humans. In 1987, Khan and her colleagues published a paper showing for the first time that the markers stretched back to Africa, showing quite clearly that this was the birthplace of the human race. New Guinean tribesmen, Parisian bartender, American teacher, Polynesian farmer, all were improbable relatives linked through one black woman 150,000 years ago. Their findings caused a sensation. The responses of people were sort of amazing. Uh, the public was genuinely interested in certain aspects of it, but there was a a tendency to misinterpret the data because of the terminology used to describe this woman, African Eve. And people thought it meant the biblical Eve, the single woman in the, in the Judeo-Christian Bible, um, the wife of Adam. I have to say, even my own uncle uh, sent me a Christmas card the year that our study was published saying, how dare you, you know grandma wasn't black. And Newsweek, the propaganda media of America, that year, you get at Newsweek, had an article of a black woman holding giving the fruit to a white male, and they called it the, um, the African Eve. Now, some of the doctors said, okay, maybe that's Newsweek of eight, 1988, I think it was July 11th. It became actually the best saying Newsweek. Last time when I was here, one of the um, you know, officers from India who was in the Air Force said his son, he met me outside and he said, my son worked on a genographic project. That was a Newsweek. That was a picture that appeared on Newsweek. And they called it uh, the African Eve, Newsweek of uh, 1988. I think July, July, May 11th or July 11th. Now, then they said, okay, maybe the mother was black. But surely, we as white people, then we must have been somewhere. We must have been the father, because black women now run after us, as you see in New York and in, news, in newspapers and in television. So they carried out another experiment, this time by IBM, the computer giant, and, and, uh, and National Geographic. 
And that is the experiment where you know, one of the officers from India's son was involved. That experiment, uh, that experiment looked at the Y chromosome. That is the gene that the father passes into the child and saying, you never know who is your father. You know, only the mother can tell the father of the child. That's called the Y chromosome. When you do a paternity test, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for the Y chromosome. They trust the original Y chromosome from what they call scientific Adam. And it was the Hazabe who lived in Tanganyika, near Lake Tanzania. In Tanzania, near Lake Tanganyika. And they look like this, the Hazabe. So you are looking at the oldest, the image of the oldest homo sapien who started about 100,000 years ago. So, as a result of that, UNESCO, UNESCO had a court which you could bring up. UNESCO, which will write the history of Africa, in volume two, volume two, chapter one, it states, at the general work of the work of Professor Lique and other subsequent work, it leads us to conclude that more than 150,000 years ago, beings morphologically identical with the man of today were living in the area of the Great Lakes at the foothills of the mountains of the moon, at the source of the Nile, and nowhere else. Nowhere else, more than 150,000 years ago. Bring it, yes. This is from UNESCO, volume two, the general history of Africa, chapter one. More than 150,000 years ago, beings morphologically identical with the man of today were living in the area of the Great Lakes at the source of the Nile and nowhere else. This is UNESCO, United Nations Education and Scientific Committee Organization. So, I, do you know what the Nile is? No? Do you? <laughs> no, you are at the source of the Nile. The mountains of the moon, Mount Kenya, Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Wenzori, together they form the moon shape. The only mountain associated with the Nile, Mount Wenzori, because of the Semurichi River and because of Nyamamba that pours into the Great Katonga. So, Africa is the first world. You are the original people. The original human being looked, of course, like my great auntie who just passed away a few days ago. But you. So, when the scriptures say, whatever religion you believe in, that man was created in the image of God and likeness, the only image of God that I know is yours. You are not the chosen people. You know, the Jews keep talking about how they are chosen people. Chosen people. And then you say, well, who chose you? And precisely to do what? What are you chosen to do? What kind of man would create a whole world, uh, children, and then begin to say, okay, you are my chosen. You are the children, I don't know you, you know, but you are my chosen. You can see there's something sick about that. But we are not the chosen people because at the time there was nothing to choose from. We were the only people. Everybody who lives on earth, who walks on earth, he is our child. We brought them into being. It is here in Africa that we brought into being articulated symbolic language. Do you know when he starts speaking, when you hear the Zulus, the Kosa, the Khoisan, the Banyankole, the Ateso, all these languages started here in the Nile Valley. It was us that started agriculture, domesticated plants and animals. And ever since we did it, few animals have been domesticated. You don't have to persuade a cow to leave the bush and come and live with you. And leave it die there and you find the following day. You try being with the buffalo today. <laughs> and see what it will do. Eh? Some of the things that we take for granted, we did. We started. The oldest mathematical script is a script called the Ishanogo from Kong. And it was the Nile Valley that the high technical civilization that started. If you are a doctor, you take what they call the Hippocratic Oath, the Oath of Hippocrates, the Greek who studied in Africa, and a man called Achilopaius. And this Achilopaius was the god of medicine. He was called, you know, the god of medicine. So the, the Greeks studied in Africa for 36 years, because the African people had a mystery system of learning that lasted 36 years. And after that, he took an oath, because that oath is still taken by doctors today. If you look in terms of scripts, mathematical script, the oldest mathematical script, the Moscow papyrus, it's called Moscow because white people from Moscow stole it from Africa and took it to Moscow. But in Moscow, you have even the papyrus that shows 
Africa, beginning to the the so-called famous problem seven. There were seven houses. Each house contained seven cats. Each cat had eaten seven rats. Each rat had eaten seven grain. Each grain contained seven hectares. How many items are mentioned in this enumeration? Problem seven. And you can answer that this is the shangle bone, the oldest mathematical script. Now, you will then have the rhyme mathematical papyrus. In terms of medicine, in terms of medicine, you have the Edwin Smith papyrus, the Carlsberg 1, Carlsberg 47, which also included the diagnosis for pregnancy, still used today. Insert a piece of clove or garlic in a woman's vagina, and if you can smell it in the morning, she will bear children. This is still how they are still <laughs> different taste, which is still being carried out today. In terms of astronomy, this is African people that dissected the skies and put, because Africa had a calendar of 360 days, and added 365 afterwards, but they dissected the sky. They had a month that had three weeks. Each week had 10 days. And each day was presided over by what they called deacon. And this deacon, you know, then you get the English word decade. By the way, River Nile was called happy. So I get the English word happiness. So these deacons had, had 12 arms. There were, there were 12 months, uh, 12 deacons, including 12 months, and they had two arms that included 24 hours. But they dissected the sky and they put a, a zutai to represent this particular section of the sky. This zutai, you still have it today at the star signs. So it was in Africa that the concept of religion started. As you sat on the night, you began to plot the movement of the stars with the rise and fall of the night. And therefore, you began to associate the rising sun with God and creation. When you see the Son of God dies at night, resurrects in the morning, and you see him coming through the cloud in his own majesty and grandeur. Because when he comes, plants can grow. When he comes, you know, uh, light can come. He is the God of light. These were all concepts that were developed in Africa. The oldest religious script being papyrus, the papyrus of Ani from where you get the You can look for the papyrus of Ani. Papyrus of Ani. Uh, it is also known as the Book of Coming Forth by Day and by Night, and also called the, uh, the, the Book of the Day. Here, this in Africa, and this particular one is from the separate temple of Seti the First in uh, the holy city of Abydos in current Egypt. Now, this is the basis of Judeo-Christian Islam, the judgment seat. Because the Africans believe that before you are born, you go before the Creator and you sign an agreement. They say, send me to Uganda, I'm going to protect the people there. The Creator says, I have sent people there before. He said, I'll be different. And that agreement is sealed in what is called Ma'at, truth, justice, righteousness, order, balance, harmony, and reciprocity. When you come to us, you forget, and you start indulging in business. But when you die, you enter into the hall of judgment. This is before Christianity. This is before Islam. Here is the individual Ali who has died. And he goes into this great hall, the hall of judgment. He's led by a noob, you know, who is the man with the dog's head. Why? The dog knows when to bury meat and return to the meat before it's putrefied. He's holding an ankh. He's holding an ankh. The ankh represents the female principle, the womb of the woman, and the shaft of a man when the brother is ready to go. The interrelationship between the male and the female produces life. So it was called the sign of life. It is also where we get the law of opposite, the duality and the plurality, the interrelationship between the male and female producing life. In Africa, one plus one is not two, because a man plus a woman equal children. So it is two, three, or, or four. <laughs> now, he goes, his heart here, is weighed against the feather of truth, which is an ostrich feather on the scales of justice. That is where you see justice represented by what? Represented by, by uh, scales. It is from Africa, from the Nile Valley. Ancient Egypt stopped here. East of the Nile was called Egypt Interior. West of the Nile was called Egypt Superior. So, your heart is heavy. It is, uh, it, it is manipulated by Ampu, who is manipulated the scale. This is a monster called Amit, ready to eat your 
so if it doesn't balance. Now, up here, you have got what they call nature rule. Nature. Nature rule. And these are like angels seated as assessors in judgment. And what do you say? You say, Oh, holy one who comes from Tefnut, I have not wronged. Mighty one who comes from Siad, I have not winked at injustice. I have not stolen, not uh, diverted the river from throwing its course. I have not told lies. I have not been quarrelsome. I have not been rapacious. What was called 42 declarations of innocence, or 42 commandments, from which Moses got 10 in my class, it didn't have any plasma. <laughs> Writing all this is a man called Tehuti. The Greeks called him Thought. T H O T H. From where I get the Thought. He's writing it in the book of deeds. And when you pass this judgment, you are then led by the Son of God, Horus, Heru, from where I get the word hour or hero. He leads you into the creator, the risen savior, Osiris. And he is, Heru has got an eyelid of a falcon, uh, an eye, no, an eyelid of a, a falcon and an eye of a cheetah, the fastest air animal, the fastest land animal producing vision. So, you come to the throne of the risen savior, Osiris. Osiris is holding a fray and a shepherd's crook. His crown is what your pope wears today. So there is nothing new under the sun except that which has been forgotten. Behind Osiris is his wife, I Oset, who has got a sister called Neptaith. The Bible represents those two people as Mary and Joseph. So when I said to you, my brothers, that there is no Nothing new under the sun except that which has been forgotten. That there are no white people in the Bible. The Bible is a reproduction of the system of education, of a system of religion that existed in Africa. Krishna also died and was resurrected. He was followed by 12 apostles. You know, he had, uh, he had, uh, he was, he, he also made wine. He, all the things that Jesus did, Christian, Krishna had done 1,500 years before. Zoroaster, you know, did the same. Mithra, you know, did the same. Osiris was murdered by his evil brother called Seth. Seth lived in a place called Ani. So they called him Seth of Ani or Satan. Now, he was resurrected and he became king of kings, lord of lords, and to life everlasting. Upon him, Egyptians appeared in prayer for eternal life. But for some of you who are Christians, here is something interesting for you. I'm going to give you some quotes. I've said to you, there are no white people in the Bible until toward the end. The Bible opens in Africa. The first five books of the Bible were written by a character called Moses. Now, we know that is not true as historians. It is true in the religion, but it is not true in history. Why? Because in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses, chapter 34, Moses writes about his own death, his own burial, and what happened after he had died. So it is not really likely that he wrote all the books because in chapter 34 of Deuteronomy, he wrote about his own death. But look at this. Moses was married to a wife from Ethiopia in the book of Numbers, chapter 11. Chapter 11, oh, what is it, chapter 12. But he was married, uh, called Zipporah. And when Aaron, his brother, complained against them, he struck them with leprosy. Uh, in 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 14.8, they say Zerah, the Ethiopian, invaded Judea with a number of 100, 1 million men. 1 million men. Now imagine that. Ethiopia, thousands of this age, you are invading with 1 million men. You got the army, 50,000, 60,000? Can you imagine the logistics of supplying the million men abroad? Can you imagine communicating with the million men? So, we are not smart. They were black smart before us. In second, again, second Chronicles, 12, chapter 12, from 2 to 3, and this Ethiopian king, Shishank, also invaded Judea, destroyed the temple of Solomon, carries away most people. That is 12, second to 3. Uh, in the book of Isaiah, 14, 43, chapter 5, 43, 2, celebrated the mineral, the wealth of Ethiopia. In the book of Amos, 9, 7, it says, princes shall come out of Egypt and Ethiopia shall stretch its hands before God. And the best chapter, I think, in the Bible is the book of Acts. 
chapter 8, verse 26. And in Acts 8, 26, it talks about the Ethiopian finance minister who was on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And it says, as he sat in his chariot, he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. Now, my dear Christians, didn't they tell you that Mapera brought you reading and writing? But the Bible says no. A finance minister from Ethiopia who was in charge of the treasury of the Queen Kandake was in a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and as he sat in his chariot, he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. Quite quickly, there were four black emperors of Rome. Four African emperors of Rome. In fact, when you go to the British Museum, Roman section, the emperors that greet you at the entrance, and you can access British Museum pictures from, uh, from Italy, were two African emperors of Rome. Septimus Severus. Septimus Severus. Governor of England and Emperor of Rome. His son Caracalla was also Emperor of Rome. The other emperor was called Nebo, and one was called Pacinius the Black. Rome was Roman in name, but not in character. Rome was founded by the Etruscans, 823, 822 BC. But its foundation was in Africa. That was the bread basket and the spiritual center of Rome. Most of the Greek, of the African gods from ancient Egypt went to Greek, Gamma Polo, Athena, Artemis, all from Africa. And you can get this from the book of Herod. <coughs> African people were in Europe before Europeans. African people under Hannibal Baca, the son of Hamilton Baca, first going to Spain and Portugal, take up Spain and Portugal, build a new city. Can you get us a picture of Hannibal? Artistic representation by Wiser, the American beer company, did representations of most of African kings and queens and produced an image of Hannibal Baca. <coughs> now, Hannibal, one of the greatest military generals. I hope you study Hannibal. Do you study Hannibal here? Yes. You study the techniques of Hannibal? Hannibal was a black person. When he rolled into Europe, his cavalry, Numidian cavalry, came from Africa, present day Mali. Ethiopian slingers. No. His brother, uh, Mago, um, his commander Mago, this is Badweiser's representation of Hannibal. Uh, his brother Mago has Rufo, has Banaco the handsome, he burns Cartago Nova, first defeats the Romans as Sadmanta, and everything the Romans say he can't do, this brother does. At the battle of Trasmeni and Trobia, 20,000 Africans defeat 80,000 Romans. And his speech, we have come this long and this far. The elephants that have brought us have since died. In front of us stand the Roman army that wants both our blood and our souls. It is such a critical struggle because if we lose, we are lost forever. The only way Hannibal was taken off Roman's back was when um, Scipio Africanus was give, got an army and came and invaded, and invaded Africa that forced Hannibal to come back in military strategy. Don't fight a man who is stronger than you. Don't meet him directly. No, scout around him. Force him into territory that is not his, that he doesn't know. Only then will you be successful. But you are fighting a huge army, they are on a, a, a new strategic ground, they can see you coming, and then you walk, but son of a No, no, no. That's not strategy. Draw him in a different territory. Divert him. Make him think, you know, I said all words deception. Make him think that you are going to attack, mass troops, and whatever. Make sure your target is elsewhere. And he doesn't know that that target. That's what the Romans eventually did to Hannibal. They would never have defeated him, but when they went to Africa, Hannibal was forced to come and, and fight the last the battle of Zama, where he was defeated. Now, in 711, 
Seven eleven. Ash comes again, coming to Europe. This time, under the great Tariq, the so-called Moors, Muslims from North Africa, they stop on an island called Gibraltar. They put what? They name the island after the commander, the brief, the border, the brief. He put a tax. Anybody coming to Africa pays. Anybody leaving Africa pays. And they fought the armies of Rodriguez and they ruled Spain and Portugal, Iberian Peninsula, for 800 years. Until 14, 1405, February 3rd, rain fell that day, and the bad day it was, when a brother called Abdi Abdila surrendered the keys of the citadels of Alhambra, and his mother was supposed to have said to him, Weep like a man for what you couldn't defend like a woman. African people built the cities of Toledo, Cordova, Safir, and the citadels of Alhambra. Those things that you see in these wicked games called football, white supremacy games that you play every day. Games like snooker. You know snooker? Pool. Everywhere you go around the village is pool. That pool is a game of white supremacy. You have got a whole world that is green. Pool is played in the green. You have got balls in, 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 in uh, European rhymes in America. They say if you are white, you are right. If you are yellow, you are mellow. If you are brown, stick around. And if you are black, go back. That is a game of white supremacy. Now, in that game, the balls they are talking about are male balls. To win, the white ball knocks all the current balls under the table. <laughs> yellow ball goes down. Red ball goes down. What ball is it, us? Yes, you! <laughs> Why they are finished the Indians? <laughs> and the Chinese? They have already killed off the Native Americans. They may be saying the price of all. Africa. Is it this really horrible that you should dance in your own degradation and even celebrate winning a white ball knocking you over? Huh? And even paying for it. It's like people sitting, I lived in Manchester, in England. 14, 14 in, in England was amazing because in Uganda, black people are millions, we were not getting on. But in England, black Indians were brothers because we are all under the same oppression. But I lived in Manchester, I thought I invested in Leeds. I had a bookshop in Trafford Park, near where Manchester City. Manchester Football Club is Truffle Club. My office, I had an organization called Action on Earth, and the office was in Mosai, and there was another stadium in the city stadium. I had a black organization called Action on Earth, 40,000 black people. I never saw a single black person go to watch white people play. And our expression was, why should they cut? They might like, go to watch cats play. The cutness of the cat is in cutting the right. You will not know a rat is a full rat. A cat is a full cat until it holds a rat and you sit running around with it. What do you do with a cat that doesn't catch a rat? You throw it away. If you saw a cat and you found rats around, dancing all around it and say, you know, we are getting together, this is the one world. Global economy, they say. Is it it? You know how the people are doing their global economy? You ask. Indian traders, why they deal to the Indian economy of textile manufacturing. Some of the best silk that the world used to make. The silk roll. White people had no clothes. They, they were called the tambu. They would make, they would kill a horse and put its, uh, its, its uh, wet hide on their body. No clothes. While the rest of humanity in Africa, the Afghan, in Nigeria, was silk and brocade at some of the best fabrics. In India, in China. White people in the 18th century, their medicine treating a sick person was to drink water from a shoe of the most troubled person. Or to treat themselves with horse manure. And the one hotel was also a mortuary. If you went for accommodation, you stayed where whatever stayed. But they destroyed 
of these cultures, of these civilizations, in order to build the foundation of their whatever in, in Manchester. So Gandhi, at one time, calls all the Indians, tell them, take off European suits and European clothes, and they put it in the fire. And he says, go back to the speeding deal. And that's why the loom is in the flag of India. You have also to practice what we call black economics. Ask yourself, where does my clothes come from? Why do you think Indians wear Indian clothes? You think they don't see the suits? They don't appear smart in them? <laughs> because they know economics. You are part of economics. When a body loses so much blood, it dies. When an economy loses so much money, it dies. Every time you wear clothes from somebody else, that you are funding that economy. The clothes maker gets paid, the exporter gets paid, the, 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 the government gets taxes. Every time you drink Coca-Cola, not to mention that Coca-Cola is made out of 3,600 chemicals, including aspartame and yellow color. The pH value of Coca-Cola is 1.5. You are better off drinking acid than throw on people's faces. <laughs> <laughs> but generally, tell me this. Why should I hold a wedding in my village and some man in Cincinnati next month? You don't have a dream in your home? The artist's home. They make a drink so sophisticated that you can even carry it in a powder form. That is science. That's high culture. You throw it with your alcohol as a powder. Huh? The bachida of shell. One cup is enough in the military. You should look at bachida. Because if you are in the jungles of God knows Central Africa and you get one cup of shell, your food is finished. But what do they give you biscuits? What is it? Genetically modified organism. Bacteria and viruses. That's what you use to invade cells. So, part of what we're talking about in Pan-Africanism is also black economics. You have to understand the economics. You have to know what would, if you are fighting with weapons of somebody else, with resources of somebody else, the moment you fight that somebody, they withdraw the resources, then what then? What happens? 